Welcome back. I'm Peggy C. Skipper, and I am still talking to Andrew Collins, and we are talking about ancient sites and actually time and mysteries. So we were just, as we took the break, we were talking about the fact that we have created this reference for time, and we seem to be very driven to stick to that, and it may not work in, in the context mm -hmm. of when we're talking about ancient sites and trying to date them. Well, um, we're talking about different time cycles, um, like the Mayan calendar, the Gregorian calendar. Obviously, there are other types of calendars with cultures, religions, and civilizations around the world. And we see them all as interlinked, you know, and indeed, as far as objective reality is concerned, they are. But in actuality, instead of seeing them all as interconnected cogs, you know, all linking and all moving, either faster or slower, but linked, there is a strong possibility in the quantum world that all those cogs are not actually connected. They're just going around. They're not linked to each other. Um, and yes, they can be going around at the, uh, you know, in, at the same speed, if you like, as others, but some of them won't be going around in the same speed. You know, in other words, time may be variable under certain circumstances. Um, I mean, part of the things that I'm working on at this very moment is a, is a new book called Light Quest, um, which is tackling the whole UFO problem from a completely new angle. Oh, good. Um, I mean, the idea that, they're, that UFOs are nuts and bolts spacecraft from another planet, um, I personally don't agree with. Um, I see them more in terms of, of manifestations from pure energy um, that can virtually take on any form that we want them to be, basically. I mean, this is something that, that's been around but for a while, but I'm taking on to the next level. But that when people get too close to these, they're drawn into what I'd call a shifted reality. Um, in other words, things start going wobbly around them. And if they get even closer, they are drawn into what I call a multi-dimensional bubble universe. Um, in other words, it's almost like a mini-universe, which is partly of their creation, partly of the creation of uh, an intelligence that I believe you know, we exists within this, this energy medium, which I, I see in terms of plasma. Um, and time and space go out the window. Time changes, um, and in many ways, these experiences, as far as our reality is concerned, go just like that. It's, it's instantaneous. It, it happens outside of our space-time. They're literally thrust from one point in time to another. It could be hours, could be days. Um, and that time is lost, but they spend in some type of time somewhere because they're having a meaningful and real experience, what we'd call an, an abduction. In the past it would have been um, a trip to the fairy world, um, uh, for a Christian, it would be a visit to paradise. Um, to others, maybe it would even be, you know, uh, down into the bowels of hell, you know, temporarily before being regurgitated out and, and, and living to tell that experience. Um, you know, it's almost of our creation. Um, what we put into it, we get out of it. Um, and all the indications are that time does not function when they're in this type of environment. So in other words, in abductions, you're not spending time away. You know, in other words, it's not, you know, time's not ticking away right. in the same, oh, look, one well, hour, two hours. People say, you know, they w kind of woke up three hours later and don't know what happened to that three-hour time. Well, time. exactly. And that happens a lot with close encounter cases. But what I'm trying to say is that the reason why that's occurring is because they've come too close to the object, they've entered or into basically a bubble universe and they're removed from t t our space-time temporarily. I mean, there are some cases where people are um, removed, you know, after encountering an object at the spot. That spot is searched. In the meantime, they'll, they'll suddenly find themselves back at that spot hours later, and this, for them, it, it, it will have happened in, in, in an instant. Right. You know, uh, to them it would have happened virtually instantaneously. They have some memory of something that's gone on, but as far as their physical body is concerned, this has all gone virtually instantaneously. And 
you know, and that's a good evidence to me that something is going on outside of space-time here, that the time no longer is, is of relevance. It's going around in whatever way it wants. Mm. I mean, the, the legends to do with the, the fairy world in the past, which come from various parts of the world, show that, um, that these type of stories exist in the past, everywhere. And the same type of thing, people would, would be t removed into the fairy realm, they'd... they'd, they'd, they'd you know, eat and drink with them, you know, they'd, they'd encounter things, whatever. Then they'd come back into the physical world and years would go by, sometimes even centuries, some of the stories. Uh, and this, this is what I've been putting into this new book, Light Quest, which uh, will be out hopefully later on this year. Um, but, you know, I think that we need to start looking at all paranormal experiences, supernatural experiences, and even spirituality, in a way which you can say there are answers within science. It might be cutting edge science, it might be on the edge of our scientific understanding, but there are answers there. That doesn't make it any less spiritual or mystical or even supernatural. It just means that we have to start looking at this in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree with you more. And you know, when we talk about aliens, you mentioned that earlier, one of the things I always say to people is, come on people, let's face it, we're all aliens. You know, none of us sprang from a rock on planet Earth. We all came from somewhere else to get here. So I, I, think, it's, I think it's interesting that uh, some people can be very closed-minded mm. about that. And so, and you talk about myths. And I think that's an interesting thing, too, because things that persist over time, whether it be lore, legend, myths, whatever, mm. I have to believe there's some truth to anything that survives time. You know, there are uh, stories, uh, all kinds of fantastical stories that come out of people, and a lot of them just die and go away. But when we see these that are passed down from generation to generation and remain, uh, even in the just context of folklore, there has to be some truth there, I think. Well, I mean, firstly, the, the word myth is a very interesting one because a lot of people see the word myth as, as non-existent, um, fantasy, not real. But a myth itself embodies um, a whole cycle of, of information. Um, it, it, it contains symbolism, archetypes, uh, and it's meant to be received by the human mind in a certain manner. It's, it's meant to trigger certain things within you, and that's not only... Um, the preservation of information within that myth, which you can then pass on to the, to the next person, but it's also meant to enchant. Um, I mean, for instance, um, in uh, Great Britain, uh, more specifically in the Isle of Man, which is a very remote part of the country, there were people who were specifically there who would have encounters with the fairy folk, um, and that, you know, they were the ones that would believe to, to, to go into the, the fairy world and they would come back and they would have this knowledge of it and it was said that they weren't allowed to reveal this information to, you know, the, the lay folk um, because it would enchant them but just sometimes that, that, you know, they would do this and it would basically beguile, like that, right? be, beguile or enchant the person so that they themselves would enter into the same realm. You know, so in other words, just by talking about certain subjects... That opens a door, sort of? It opens the doors. It's, it's a door. I mean, it's like looking at a, a, a famous painting or a sculpture and being lost within it and suddenly come to it. I, 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 my, my mind was lost just for a few seconds. I was there in that painting. I was, I was there, you know, if, let's say the Sistine Chapel or... Leon, you know, Leonardo da Vinci's um, The Last Supper. You know, people stare at it and they actually enter inside that painting momentarily because it's, it, there is a reality to it. And a painting, uh, you know, or a story is very similar to a myth that it's meant to have an effect upon the person who receives that information. You know, it's meant to cause change within the mind. Uh, and that's it. Um, I mean, obviously, the way it's told, the nature of the content, how much the original myth has been preserved within 
within it as it's retold from generation, obviously, has an effect. You know, and, and this, is, this is magical, very important. Whereas similar stories, let's say like a joke, telling a joke doesn't have the same effect. You know, I mean, all right, you might laugh at a certain joke, it might make you fall over the floor with, with laughter, but other jokes, somebody tells you, and you think, I, I don't get it, that's right. not funny. Yeah. And the reason being is that quite clearly, you know, the, the, the emphasis of, of the joke, if it's not funny, has been lost somewhere along the line, or it was badly constructed in the first place. It's the same thing with myths. If a myth works properly, you know, it will have the right effect to you. It will enchant or beguile you uh, into virtually becoming a part of it. It, you, it will become a real within you. Right. That is interesting because as you were talking about that, uh, the feeling I was getting, well, that may be the an sort of the answer to why one person can paint a painting and it become a masterpiece and another person paint a painting and maybe have technically hmm. the same skills absolutely but is the same energy put absolutely. into it that's going to then affect yeah. the viewer yeah. oh i love that yeah i think that is absolutely very and, the, and one of the reasons why i think certain paintings work is because some of the great masters of the past have understood things like sacred geometry the golden section the importance of of archetypes and symbols with you know within those uh, paintings um, and, it, it, and it affects the brain in an unconscious way. Um, and it may well be that they actually painted it in part in a, a semi-unconscious state. I mean, within martial arts, for instance, um, they, there, there is a thing called no mind or no mindedness, which is a state whereby they're able to forget or, or try and remove the conscious mind from what they're doing and allow the unconscious to come through to make the moves and actions and it's believed that when this happens the conscious mind actually removes itself from the body so that they can actually witness the body from a position outside and they can see the physical body in a slow motion situation so that anybody that's attacking them the, their moves will become very slow so they've got all the time in the world to make the right decision on how to counter that. Um, and this no-mindedness is something which can be um, equated with the way that artists um, sometimes go into an unconscious state. A channel, when they do, And it's, those are the sort of paintings that will most affect people, unquestionably. Mm -hmm. I get that. And I think that would apply to just about anything. I know I have a friend who's a very, very good cook, and I asked her one time, because I'm not particularly a good cook, you know, what her secret was. And she said, I put a little love in everything I cook. And, you know, I started doing that, and my cooking's gotten much better. Yeah. I mean, I think that, and I think that is such a simple energy exchange. And if people could just allow themselves to do that, and I, I think the next step to that is do what you're passionate about, and you're more likely to put that kind of energy mm. in it. Would you agree with that? Yeah, and uh, I mean, you say about the, the, the lady putting the love in the, the food, it's a similar thing to a priest blessing water and making it Absolutely. sacred. I mean, work has been done to show that changes do occur on a, um, a molecular or particle level within water that has been blessed. This is, this is what was done a while back. So that, you know, when, when water is seen to be holy, there is something different about it. It does contain different information so that when it is absorbed within you, it will have a different effect from, let's say, just taking tap water. Um, well, you don't call them taps over, I think it's faucets over here. Faucet <laughs> yeah, water. Yeah, exactly. um, and, uh, 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 and drinking that. Um, and it's the same thing, really. Uh, and it's the same as plants. I mean, obviously... Some people are able to. Out of time. I'm going to have to stop. I would love to continue, but we're out of time. Ah, okay. So, but thank you so much for no, joining us. No, my pleasure. Appreciate Absolutely. It. And thank you for joining us. I'm Peggy Sue Skipper, and we'll see you next time.